Hello and welcome to We Work Together, a podcast about working in partnership to improve the health and care of people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate, and the relationships between the organisations and people involved. In this episode, Partnership Director Ian Holmes talks to Owen Williams, Chief Executive at Calderdale and Huddersfield NHS Foundation Trust, about his leadership journey, hospitals working together, and meeting the health and care needs of our diverse population. So Owen, you've been a leader within the West Yorkshire Harrogate system for quite a while now. Can you tell us a little bit about your career and your leadership journey to date? You know, I started life organisationally working for the Yorkshire Building Society that had its main headquarters in Bradford. Uh, That was my first job at 18 and I I got that job after um, pulling industrial wires before I I, I became a deeds filer. Now, I don't know if you can remember, Ian, you look young enough, Um, maybe not to, but there used to be a time when um, mortgage deeds and title deeds and stuff were actually a big thick package of stuff. And my, my first job was kind of moving that stuff around for people who worked in the securities department. I remember there's a guy called Clive, he was the manager at the time, he said, um, if you're doing this job for 12 months, you might need to think about another career, but if you're doing it for three or, three or four months and you get out into the department, then hope springs eternal. I, so six months later, yeah. I actually got out into the department and I, I worked in the securities department. And then... At that point, because I only had three O levels at that point, uh, Maths, English and Technical Drawing. At that point, I think it dawned on me that probably wasn't going to be enough. So I I actually started to study at the same time. So first of all, I got qualified in building society practice and I also started to take a range of BTECs and all that sort of stuff. Um, And um, from that um, is where in the Yorkshire Building Society I got introduced to market research and then started to have a career growth in there. Um, It's bizarre to think that, you know, uh, my title will be doctor uh, in the not too distant future. Absolute journey from those three O levels to say the least. But nonetheless, um, that Yorkshire Building Society experience was quite important and, and from there... I went to have a career, uh, worked for a company called CACI in London who do geodemographics. They're quite well known for uh, a thing called ACORN, which is a classification of residential neighbourhoods yeah. uh, and stuff like that. So that's the analytical side mm-hmm. of me. I uh, went to work in London for a period of time and then uh, came back and worked in an advertising agency, actually, and it was from there in Leeds, and it was from there that um, uh, I was listening to Radio 5 Live and the, they were sort of mockingly talking about Bradford looking to recruit its first director of marketing communications. And sometimes I've described this as, as, as one mad moment as a Bradford lad. I thought, why not? Mm-hmm. Uh, and as I've said uh, to people before, three gruelling interview days later, uh, and that was a, a really, you know, that's one of my toughest interviews, uh, particularly because I just didn't have. Um, uh, really much knowledge about the public sector and as I say some people might quit and say nothing's changed there then. From there I I got the the job of Director of Marketing Communications for Bradford Council and uh, if you you do a Google search um, Owen Williams gloom buster uh, I think those articles are are still there and uh, and that was it so I was plastered on the front page of my local newspaper called the gloom buster but I I say you know seriously um, it it was quite um, a, a real opening because not too far after I'd been appointed, the, 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 the Bradford riots occurred. You know, that was really, really sobering. And as I said, you know, when you've got two or three hundred satellite dishes outside the town hall. Mm. Um, and, you know, I always remember I, I got an email from somebody from, um, I think it was Barbados, who was um, thinking of coming to, to Bradford um, to, to study. And they'd heard about the, the riots and they'd been given my name to say, is it safe to come? So that really tells you about yeah. the reach yeah, uh, of where that is. But we, we, we worked through it, and it was interesting because uh, at that time, um, Bradford, as it is now doing, chose to uh, attempt to become the European capital of culture. And even though Bradford wasn't successful, that was used as quite an important method of bringing uh, the communities together. When we, we did the initial survey work about do you think we should be European capital of culture? Only 8% of the Bradford population thought that we should or that that was possible. Really? By the time the decision point was coming, it was up to 80%. Wow. 
so we've done quite a lot of work there and that is where this granular piece always comes in, into mind because um, once you start speaking to people at a real person to person level is when you start to get things so so I spent a few years doing that and then I moved to Rossendale Council and that was my first chief executive's job. Tell me a bit about Rossendale. So again, uh, a bit of a first there. Um, so again, the, the, certainly the, the most senior black Asian minority ethnic person that had worked at that uh, local authority. And you'll find throughout this podcast I will keep referring uh, back to that point because... Uh, it's quite important mm, to me, as you'll, as you'll see. But it, it, that was quite interesting because that was a local authority that was described by the Office of the Deputy Prime Minister that existed at, at that moment as one of the worst local authorities in the country. By what measures? By the measures that they had at that time, which were linked to things like the Comprehensive Performance Assessment and right. stuff like that. But it was a local authority that, in effect, was being intervened. Right. Um, so it, it was really struggling. So. It was um, quite brave, I guess, of um, the local authority elected members at that time, you know, to select someone like myself Mm. who had not worked in a district environment Mm. uh, and still comparatively was quite new to the public sector. What they thought was, um, given the context of the organisation at that time, would a safe pair of hands do it or did they need to take a bit of a risk and I think they chose to take a bit of a risk. The interesting thing about that though is um, I was recruited um, through a process that was run by the North West Employers which is an organisation that does a lot of people related work but does recruitment selection for for local government and uh, there was an article in what I would call the the municipal journal which is kind of like the HSJ equivalent in local government um, it was a bit of a snobby article, really, where um, somebody from a recruitment consultant was saying, if I'd have gone through a classic recruitment process with classic recruitment headhunters, would have I been able to get that job, mm. uh, basically? And I remember the guys at Northwest Employers were quite irate um, because they were saying, well, you know, why would we be second-class citizens as recruitment people, mm. so on and so forth? But, you know, the, 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 the story of uh, Rossendale, effectively, was turnaround did take place working with some wonderful people there and that was a bit of a baptism for me you know that's the moment when you realise what accountable means Mm, Um, you know it's not about others how many years did you work with the sector director so so by time by time I got there I'd only done about three years so by comparison terms you know typically in local government uh, and it's still relevant today um, certainly in districts people tend to come from a, a planning uh, legal, financial background. You do your time presumably as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. time served. Yeah. In in Mets, it tends to be those same areas, but also the education and social care. In fact, it's very rare that you would get somebody from a communications mm. kind of background um, coming into that. So, in all in all, you know, ways you could think of convention. Yeah, it, it's been a kind of a. An interesting thing, the way I got into um, public service, and I think, you know, at that moment it was quite early for me. I was really sort of caught up in the the public servant yes. ethos. And is that what makes you tick? Because obviously you've done very senior jobs for a lot yeah. of years. Is, is that where you get your energy from? Yeah, right? it is, and it, it's um, you know I have no problems getting up on a wet Monday, snowy morning as we yeah. are today, because I, I realise why I'm here in some way, shape, or form. That's about um, supporting. Uh, local people to live the lives they want to be, to live and also to make sure that the colleagues who are involved whether it's about providing care whether it's about pushing somebody on a trolley mm. that they feel that they're supported to do their work you know and I, I get a buzz uh, off of that yeah. uh, and I get a buzz off of um, trying to make a difference yeah <laughs> executive into the the acute sector of yep. the NHS what, what was behind that and, and what's different about that well it wasn't any it wasn't any deep career planning I'm, I'm not a deep career planner but the, a certain set of events happened um, this trust went out to recruit and for whatever reason that didn't take place and then they went through uh, another process after suggesting that they'd be interested in in speaking to myself Mm. and uh, I was subsequently uh, the first black Asian minority ethnic chief exec for this trust 
And interestingly, at that time, I think there was only three black Asian minority ethnic chief execs across provider organisations at that time. Mm -hmm. It actually went down to one. Wow. So I was the only one for a while. I think it's now back up to six. Right. But that is still six across, if you talk about the UK, a, a couple of hundred organisations. And in fact, if you just combine local government with NHS providers across the UK, that's around 696 organisations, of which I estimate there's about 13 black Asian minority ethnic chief execs. And I make no apologies for saying that's not satisfactory uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Working age population of this country, black Asian minority ethnic is 14%. So therefore, you would expect, not unreasonably, to see around about mm. 100 black Asian minority ethnic yeah, yeah. chief execs. Um, I know life's not that straightforward, but 13 is unacceptable. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, just on that theme then, um, since, since we, we've spoken about it a couple of times, obviously one of the ten big ambitions of our five-year strategy for yeah. the auction Harrogate is to um, get to a point where we've got a leadership that is representative of, of the population that we serve, as you're describing. What would you say are the two or three big things that we need to do in order to, to get there? I know it's a really difficult question to answer, and, but, but I'm, I'm conscious that you were yeah. uh, one, of the, one of the leaders who was really pushing for that ambition to be framed in that way. Well, I think it's f for everybody in leadership to understand why. Mm -hmm. um, because I think sometimes um, people get caught up in the, what I call the, the cosmetic or the visual or the numbers. So, you know, I've just quoted some numbers yeah. to you, and people say, well we need to be representative. I think that's important, but it's certainly not the primary reason why I think this stuff's important. For me, it's about what I call eyes. Uh, and what I mean by that is, if you've got a set of eyes that are common eyes looking at a situation, then they're likely to come up with solutions and things that make sense to them as a common group. Yes. If you've got a diverse set of eyes, then they could be looking at the same issue, yeah. but maybe have a different perspective. Mm. So how does that work out in practice? So if you take our catchment here as a trust, we are co-terminus, so we share the same footprint with Calderdale Council. In Calderdale Council's area, geography, the um, white population is around 86%. Uh, last census, it may have changed now, but last census, 86%. BAM, as I would call it, is 14% then, let's say, for argument's sake. In Kirklees, uh, is uh, a white population of 79.1%, mm. and then the rest is, yeah. is BAM. So therefore, if you would think about who are going to be the regular attenders mm -hmm. that um, come into an A&E, Okay, logic would tell you yeah. it's likely to be majority white. Yeah. I think that's what logic would tell you based on those broad parameters. But overall, if you look at, say, the top 20 uh, geographical areas where we have most attenders coming per population, mm -hmm. that dynamic is 51% black Asian minority ethnic. Mm. Wow. The reason I know that is because the eyes thing. Yes. Whereas if you've got a certain set of eyes that may or may not be interested in that sort of stuff, okay, Yeah. then, and, and when I say they're interested, it's not like they don't care, but it's just we, we, we look for what we're yeah, used to. of course we do, yeah. And, you know, when you get to a, a, a situation where you've got that level uh, and that mix, then... Um, you then start asking yourself the question, look at the performance of A&E over the last X years. Are we granular enough in our understanding yeah. about what's happening? Yeah. And my hypothesis, you can guess, would be because we've not got enough diverse eyes looking for things, yes. then... We need to think about these things in a different way. Yeah. Sort of the idea of leadership, really, and, and yeah. obviously one of the buzzwords at the minute is system leadership and yeah. collaborative leadership. Can you tell us what what that means to you, and whether you've thought about your leadership style, adapted your leadership style towards the yeah. system approach? Some people might giggle at this, but I think certainly in an organisation um, perspective, the sort of hope I would have in terms of my 
my style of leadership would be what what some academics talk about a servant leader type model mm -hmm. which is kind of essentially about trying to um, get to a place where you create the conditions for people to be able to mm -hmm. perform you'll see me in an A&E department serving cups of coffee and saying hello and connecting with people you won't see me in there with a clipboard saying why are we performing well mm -hmm. that's just never going to happen yeah. because you know what with the best will in the world I'm not a clinician, it's not my skill set, mm. but can I create the conditions for those people who can yeah. to be able to perform to their optimum? So that's the organisational bit, and within that, there's a kind of a, a thing that you have to do, which is that moment about where you know you need to be more directive, and or that moment where you need to be more inclusive, and mm. you kind of oscillate yeah. up, and, up and down that. And that word directive is, is an interesting word in that, in an organisational sense, as a chief executive, there is a point where if there's ambiguity or there's a need for clarity, the the positional power and whatever else brings with it that opportunity to be more decisive. Yes. When you're in a, a collaborative space, and it's not just about dealing with people who are in peer roles, such as other chief execs of other providers or CCG accountable officers, you do not have the same opportunity around being directive. Uh, you work much more through a spin of influence. Mm. Um, and that's the, that's the real difference. Mm. You know, the, there are very, very few people, if I ever use the, the word of ordering somebody about, you, you, you don't order yeah. people about in a, in, a, in a partnership, whoever they are. Yes. That has to be done through your ability to influence. And we did quite a bit of work here as an organisation, probably really first started it about six years ago. I've been here eight years, but we started it about six years ago, which was actually having workshop development days, practising what we would call the skills and competency of collaboration. Mm. So actively practising that. What does that look like? Doing role-playing, um, media role-playing about you know, being in different scenarios and so on and so forth. Because I firmly believe that collaboration isn't somebody you can, something that you can just turn on and off. It is something that you have to practice at and you have to have that ability to step into the other person's shoes mm -hmm. and kind of get a feeling. Those are all aspects about what makes system leadership work. Yeah. The other thing I'd just add, and, uh, you know, I make this point um, and I really want people to hear it, is we've got a rare opportunity and what I mean by that is there's a group of us as leaders who have kind of grown up together mm. people like Tom Reardon, Kirsten England, Rob Webster, Wallace Sampson certainly from my perspective these are people who certainly they and, and I have shared a leadership journey together yeah. that's a real opportunity mm. and actually what I think we've also done quite well is the people who are newer to that arrangement, people like Brendan Brown, uh, more recently Mel at Bradford, yeah. Steve. We, we've kind of created a way, I think, where it's easier to come into yeah. oh, that, that arrangement. Yeah. I think potentially we take that for granted mm. and actually that's a really important moment because if you wanted to see real change out there, I would posit that we probably will never get a better opportunity to tackle health inequality mm -hmm. while that group of people are together. Now we've got to be careful here because some people listening to this might think that this is all about our buddies and mates. No. no, it's about those relationships that give collaboration and system working that much better opportunity. Mm -hmm. Because if myself and Rob have a disagreement, we don't have to, you know, sort of whisper in our organisations. We go have a conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Or equally, if we, we, we were passionate about something, the same thing applies. And that is something that does not exist in every system no. elsewhere. Absolutely. But I think there's a thing where we need to realise the moment for us is now. Mm -hmm. I think that's really, really well put. And, and, and obviously my conversations with, with other folk around the country, I think absolutely those strength of relationships and almost the trust that's now beginning to be established between the leaders mm -hmm. is, is, is really powerful. What, what, how do we capitalise on that? And what, what do you think the next steps for the partnership are in terms of building on that and turning it into something really tangible? I, I think we've um, got to a stage where, you know, whether it's system leadership executive, those Tuesdays, for example, have now become quite 
an established feature. We've done some developmental stuff. Mm. I think we're we're kind of there in terms of relationship building. We can always do more. But I think now we have to turn our attention. And, and again, I, I go back to some of the points I was talking before about if you look at those people who are turning up at A&Es and E's mm. and things like that, we have to turn our attention now to how do we take that ability and those relationships to start, ironically, being more granular and working at that place level. And when I use the word place, I'm not talking local authority footprints. I think in some respects I'm even struggling to talk about the sort of 30,000 to 50,000 footprints. I'm talking at that more granular level Mm. where things are happening where because as partners and organisations we tend to work in aggregate numbers, yeah. okay, I think the moment, the sort of cap the end moment for us is now to use that to say how are we going to start to influence granular understanding yeah. and not impose ourselves at that granular level but find a different way of working. Yeah. And I still think we need to challenge some of our assumptions about who we think's going to do what. And I'll give you an instance of that. You you often hear reference to primary care colleagues, a kind of a they're almost like positioned sometimes as this magical silver bullet that is, you know, a, a certain geographic level because they're there at that geographical level that somehow that they can do something at the, at yes. the community level uh, and so on and so forth. Well, yes, they can, but the the notion that they're in the best place to do that, I think is a slightly misguided because there's work for them and us to do yeah. in terms of building relationships up with communities and at that granular level. Yes. So we get into, and I'm not a fan of the, the term, but I'm going to use it, that we start to co-produce something. Yeah. And actually, we're, we're led by those people who live and exist at that granular level, Absolutely. not as opposed to us turning up and saying, well, you know, the Henry Ford, you can have any car you want as long as it's black type yes. model. Yes. Um, Absolutely. There's, and I don't know if you recall, but um, at the last um, system leadership executive meeting where we were discussing health inequality, I made a point about how do we develop the capacity mm-hmm. because you know um, I used at that time I used a, an ED consultant but I'll take it to a GP a GP still works within some walls that are called a GP practice mm-hmm. that people come to yeah. there's an absolute assumption because some of those people will be sharing some of their most intimate feelings that therefore that that GP or those GPs or community nursing colleagues have a real insight. Mm. They'll have some insight, but the conversation's different. If I'm talking to you in high stress moments, that's different to when I'm talking to you when you're feeling better. And there's a lot of work for us to do still to really understand why are, for example, certain communities now absolutely choosing to come straight to the hospital and they're not being admitted. No. So why are they making those choices? What do they feel is something that they're missing? Or possibly, maybe their thought process is, no, I'm gaining. Yeah. There's something there. Now, there'll be some people listening to this and saying, we know all that. But I come back to your question. Well, if we know it, yes. what have we done about it? Exactly. And here's the opportunity yeah. to do something about it. Yeah, it's really helpful. Thank you. Could we talk a little bit about the West Yorkshire Association of Acute Trusts yeah. um, program? Obviously, the six acute trusts have had this association for about four or five years now. Yeah. I think nationally it's seen as one of the strongest acute collaborations in the country. Can you just talk a little bit about what it's been doing, what you think the reasons for the successes have been? You've just done some of that previously. Well, again, so the, there's, there's things about relationships. I think, you know, people can be, will, I think, respect my candour on this. Not all organisations have fully got over what I call the sovereignty bug. We play that sometimes as well. But I think if you look at where we were as six organisations uh, four or five years ago, uh, and remember before that group really coming together, there was no real history. Oh. Um, you know, most geographies have some sort of history. 
uh, those entities or organisations come together. We didn't really have that. And forgive me if anybody who's a previous chief exec has a different view. Yeah, I certainly don't but but that's not yeah. what I've been able to identify. Yeah, exactly. So coming together was quite important to us. The fact that we've kind of stayed together, the fact that our chairs are involved in the committee and com common type stuff, uh, the fact that we've been able to bring different groups, clinical, non-clinical, together shows that we've we've been able to to move how we see each other. But you know, I I, I don't think any of the my chief exec colleagues would mind me saying this. We've still got work to do um, in terms of that sovereign, yeah. both collaborative balance. But you know, we have a program that we work to. We've got some shared goals that we're working to and some shared pieces of work and you know we can give examples like the vascular and so on and so, so forth where we've taken some mature yeah. discussions yeah. and decisions around some of that and the way I talk and discuss when we're in the chief execs forum we'll know if uh, the West Yorkshire Association of Acute Trust is um, really progressing when effectively each chief exec can describe a success story, yeah. but also can talk through some really difficult decision yeah, yeah. that they've had to, t you know, they have to come back to the ranch yes. and have a really difficult conversation with colleagues that they work with in their sovereign organisations, mm. but they've been able to describe that and get uh, agreement that the greater good mm. uh, is what we're trying to get to here. I know I've certainly had to do that with the likes of vascular and so on and so forth. Yeah my hope um, and it's not that I'm wanting to have everybody having a down moment mm. but I think you really know when partnership is really really when you know whether it's good or bad we're in that shared space yes yes because the summary point's really important isn't it because obviously we talk about the partnership being the servant of places and the servant yeah. of organizations and organizations will continue to be accountable um, but I guess it's how we use the partnership to support organisations to, to deliver um, their goals as well, isn't it? Yeah. One of the features of the West Yorkshire Area Partnership is the, is the breadth of the partnership. We've got really strong relationships with the councils, VCS organisations. Obviously, our partnership board is chaired by the Calderdale Council leader. What, what opportunities do you think that breadth of partnership presents us? What I see in our partnership is I see um, steadily that, again, those relationships are getting stronger it's not about size of organisation as much as it used to be. Yeah. And the more we continue down that path, I come back to the principle of the more variety we've got in terms of eyes, when it comes to complex issues, yeah. we've got a better chance of, of dealing with them. And mm. you know, make no mistake, nobody who's worked in this system, you know, people like myself, we have to take responsibility for the fact that health inequality exists. Yeah and also that actually under our watch there are some arguments that it is stalled or is getting yeah. worse. Yeah. Now we've got to do something to address that and there's a bit where I keep saying some of us including myself we have to kind of get over ourselves a little bit yeah. and start focusing on that stuff mm. and start focusing on what we do yeah. different. <laughs>90 million pounds coming in I think to West Yorkshire and Harrogate can you just tell us a little bit about how the programme works and what your aspirations are for the programme going forward yeah so I mean one of the things that we've tried to do is to first of all develop uh, a plural strategy and I use plural lens in that it's plurally conceived it's not you know one entity but something that kind of fits with um, what the West Yorkshire and Harrogate Partnership itself has described as its five-year plan and mm. where it's trying to go. So we've tried to get the alignment with the estates piece um, linked also with what is the overall sort of uh, integrated care system ambition. We've probably got a little bit of work to do on how we make sure that the clinical strategy kind of yeah. um, synthesises all that. But again, we're quite clear, I think, yes. about where we're at. In terms of the capital and estates group, what I think we've done well is, first of all, um, we've understood place, yes. so we've respected place, mm. and we've done work to try and make sure that 
where some places are have got good capacity and a good feel for estates planning and and, and so on, that they can progress. Yeah. But equally, those areas that are less well developed, what can we do mm. to help support them? And that feels still like an ongoing narrative. Yeah. But having the strategies and what we're working to, I think, has been helpful. Yes, uh, it's, helpful it, it, it's a framework to work to. But alongside those place-based um, things, we've also had some thematic groups. So, for example, thematics around digital, thematics around um, primary care that I think, again, works to a good collective principle. And again, if you use that theme of multiple eyes, mm. the more diverse the eyes that you've got in terms of a problem, I think the better yeah. uh, we've got. And I think we've also worked quite well with regulators. I, I think, you know, people, you know, get quickly into the land, land of a deficit when they talk about regulators and stuff like that. Yeah. I think whether it's the Capital and Estates Group, um, whether it's the uh, broader ICS, whether it's um, uh, the, uh, the West Yorkshire and Harrogate uh, Association of Acute Trust, whatever that dimension is, I think the one thing that we've tried to understand is that the regulators and government have got a job to do as well. Mm. And how can we make that work yeah. for each other as opposed to let's have a fight? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think we've done that. We've tried to do that with all aspects of our relationship with NHS yeah. England particularly. And yeah. England. yeah. So I, I think those are features of uh, what's happening at the Capital and Estates uh, stuff. But the, the point I keep talking about, and it's one of the reasons why um, when we were talking about having a conversation around some of this previously, um, for me until there's sort of cranes in the sky yeah. things getting built yeah. jobs being created because we shouldn't underestimate the impact economically we shouldn't underestimate the impact sustainably mm. but until we get some of that going yeah. then 800 and odd million pounds is just a number yes absolutely right you're a trustee and the vice chair of the nhs confederation how does this fit alongside your role within the partnership particularly with regard to diversity issues the diversity piece yes. um, has been something that I've been trying to uh, influence both um, within the confed itself. You know that old rule about you know you need to sort your own house, yes. get your own house in order uh, around before you start having some of these conversations. But also sort of the the way that we can start to influence one what our members do because the, the beauty about the confed is it's a very broad church. Yes of organisations and entities, you know, it's not just about providers, it's not just about commissioners, yep. it's not just about England, you know, it's quite mm. diverse in, in, the, in the way that um, uh, we're constructed, but it's then using that and saying, well, what can we do to influence things like the diversity conversation yep. that we, 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 we have, trying to advocate for our member organisations, but also not losing sight of patients, because again, it can be so easy when you're talking at those levels to think about aggregation to think about policy all the time yeah. and kind of lose sight of what we're all here for in the first place Absolutely. so i i try and do um the let's not forget that link yes conversation yes and it, it's quite interesting because i was just on a, a conversation last week where i've certainly offered our system local system so that sort of Calderdale Kirkley system as an opportunity to for the confed to explore what could be done from a diversity and inclusion inclusivity perspective yeah. but also the ICS yes what could we be doing and then maybe the confed to use that mm. as a and you know I keep making this point you know we're one of the largest um, integrated care systems if not the largest depends which way you 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 look at it if we can get things done in our system, mm. my belief is, well, what's the excuse for any other system yeah, uh, in that? And I'm trying to create that link also between the Confed then to say, you know, if we can get some good proof of concepts on several different dimensions, can we use the Confed then yes. to also help share best practice? Yeah. Um, and that's a revolving door, so it's not just from one entity to the other. It's also about how do we share the learning, and that's the, the really good thing about the Confed, uh, and the, the, the aspect I enjoy about the role, is seeing about what, what works elsewhere. This has been episode seven of the We Work Together podcast. 
Thanks to Owen Williams and Ian Holmes, and thank you for listening. Join us again next time, when we'll be joined by more partners who work together to improve health and care for people in West Yorkshire and Harrogate.